Hello, I'm Professor Hello. Tanya Byron and um, I should be not virtual today, I should be standing there in front of you and I'm really sorry that I was unable to make it in the end. However, I hope that what we're about to film here will have lots of relevance to you and will be um, useful in terms of your thinking about young people and digital worlds and um, I have made a promise that the next time there's something going on in Wales that you want me for, I will be there. Um, but uh, it's very nice to say hello to you virtually. Uh, so, Professor Tanya Byman, thank you for being willing to speak with us here. You're speaking at the Wise Kids Conference, real array of people from teachers, social workers, youth workers. Um, maybe if you could share with us a bit of the background of, of how you came to be looking at child internet safety. Well, I was asked to look at harmful and inappropriate material as it relates to children and young people, not just in terms of the internet, but also in terms of video games. And six months is a really, really tight uh, kind of deadline to do that sort of reviewing and the most important thing to begin with was to be really clear about what I wasn't looking at because you know it's a huge area you know there's the sexualization of children there's commercialism uh, and the online space and children there's also illegal content but I made sure I was very clear that those weren't within my terms of reference and I was really looking at harmful and inappropriate material now what I first found and I think it's still around to some degree because this is a real kind of catch-up for my generation I think in terms of how we relate to children and young people and technology and to quote Mark Prensky who said in 2001 the kids are the digital natives we're the digital immigrants the digital immigrants were contacting me during my review and they were having a massive kind of meltdown about, about technology you know from technology is the root of all evil technology is making our children obese technology is making our children antisocial technology is making our children illiterate and so on and so on and so on and so the beginning of this piece of work was very much about dealing with moral panic. And it's very interesting, if you look back historically, that, for example, when Caxton and the printing press, you know, was first around, there was huge moral panic. You know, the printed word on a page that isn't controlled by the church. So it, it, we understand that new technologies, new ways of communicating ideas, if you like, the democratisation of information and the exchange of thoughts and ideas is extremely challenging, particularly when the people who are embracing it more are the younger generation and the people who are trying to manage that and write policy around it are the older generation who, quite frankly, don't really get it. So you come from a very negative point of view. And for me, it felt in extremely important to try and find a way to be proportionate and balanced in all of that. An interesting point for you is when you write government policy, the, the first thing you do is what's called a call for evidence. So you say, hello, this is me, Tanya Byron, this is my review, these are my questions, anybody can answer them. So I had thousands and thousands of respondents from industry, from government, from education, from the third sector, children's charities, from law enforcement, parents, carers, youth groups, non-governmental organisations, everybody, and kids and young people. And the same voice, the voice that I really could listen to that made real sense to me, was the voice of children and young people. And I remember two things. The first was a young, a young woman, sort of 15 years old, saying, do you know what? I just wish someone could help my mum and dad get this enough so I don't have to be the one putting the filters on and policing my younger siblings' behaviour. And actually, they can just accept this is part of our life and this is what we do. And then the other one, which was absolutely adorable, was a nine-year-old boy who said to me, Professor Byron, he said, I really, really like the internet. And sometimes I like, like to click around and do things. But what really scares me, he said, is sometimes when I'm sitting at dinner and there's a ring on the doorbell, I'm really scared that the army has come to collect me because I might have by mistake clicked on a recruitment page. And I just thought that was the sweetest thing because in a sense what he's saying is it's great, it's huge, it's the whole wide world out there, but could someone just help me find my way around it and just do what feels right for me? So you have the same voice of children and young people and you have the panic of the older generation who don't get it. And so for me, the first thing to do was to be really specific about my terms of reference. And I think the best way of kind of boiling it all down is to say that we need to look at three key areas when it comes to children and young people and the online space. We need to look at content, which is what everybody worries about. What are they seeing? What are they reading? What's coming at them? You know, how is it affecting them? Absolutely, we need to think about that. We have regulation around content in other areas when it comes to children and young people. We need to think about contact. 
who is contacting our children young people, who are they contacting, how is that happening, and also conduct. How are they behaving online? How are we preparing our digital generation to learn about digital communication in a way that facilitates communication positively and doesn't get them into trouble? And so that was the kind of broad canvas that I was kind of working on. So having set out the, that context of the challenges we face, what are the, some of the uh, recommendations you were making in your, in your report? I suppose the headlines were these. When it came to the internet side, I felt that there were three key areas that we should be looking at. We should be looking at how, as appropriate, depending on the age and stage of development of the child or young person, we should restrict access. So that's really just helping and empowering parents, teachers, carers, the kind of, you know, us of the kind of older adult generation, how can we use the tools that are available in terms of filters, things like that, to actually be very clear about where our young people are going. If they're little children online, that they're in a sort of safer walled garden, so we have those kind of sites there for them. When they're older, how do we give them more access, more freedom? If we have a safe search, how can we make sure that safe search stays on? And I suppose the really shocking thing is, when you, when you talk to parents and teachers, in the main, most of them don't understand that and I think feel so disempowered by their lack of understanding of the technology in and of themselves of self, that actually can't make that leap that really all we need to do is take the offline risk messaging and risk management messaging that we give to children and put it in the online space. Okay, don't give your details out to strangers. If someone contacts you, you don't know who they are, don't contact them back. If something happens or you see something that makes you feel unsettled, tell a grown-up. You're not going to get into trouble. So for me, it was about how do you restrict access as appropriate. There's also something about reducing availability, and that very much then looks to the digital industries, the online industries, the platforms, you know, and so on, how they are actually managing spaces where they know there are lots of children and young people. What are the standards? How, what is moderation? How is it done? How do you manage reputational management systems so you encourage really great digital citizenship behaviour amongst children and young people? So these for me were, were the two key issues. But the final issue, and for me I have to say is the biggest issue, is about increasing resilience. We live in an incredibly risk averse culture. I mean, I, I've written a lot about this, and one of the phrases that I've, I spend a lot of time writing around is the notion that we're, we're actually raising children in captivity, okay? So we have this kind of overblown paranoia, this fear of the offline world and risk to children to the degree that since 1989, the radius of play for children and young people in, in Britain has reduced by almost 90%. So when I was a kid, I was out on my bike, I was exploring, my identity was being created with my friends, I'd then come home, but there were greater freedoms for children. In the kind of risk culture, the risk-averse culture, the health and safety culture, the culture of paranoia and fear about children and freedom, children are being raised in captivity. So where are they doing their childhood? They're doing it online because that's what's available to them. Children need to socialise, they need to play, they need to communicate, and they need to take risks. It's part of childhood. And if we're not giving them the space to do that offline, in the real world, because of our paranoia about what might be out there for them, they're going to do it online. But the sort of irony of all that is, actually, as an adult generation, we are better equipped to teach them risk management skills for the real world, because we don't talk to kids about the online world, because we don't get it. And so you do have children who are the victims of the most hideous cyberbullying or children who naively are talking to people off online and then agreeing to meet them offline. These aren't huge numbers, but they're big enough for us to actually think, are we doing enough to equip our children and young people to really understand how they can garner all the opportunity and benefit of the online space, but keep themselves safe? And that is what I mean by increasing resilience. Embrace it, acknowledge the benefits, allow children to use it for creation, for learning, for identity formation. But let's give them the respect of enabling them to learn how to look after themselves. And if we ban, and if we censor, and if we block, they will find their way around it, because that's what kids do. And I think that is the most important message for me. 
So there's many practitioners watching this. They'll have heard those, those big recommendations from industry and others. But how should the practitioner, the, the frontline worker, respond to, to all of this? Well, I think the first thing for me to say in response to that is almost to throw it back to you and say, when you say, what should we be thinking about, parents, practitioners, teachers, you're talking about the adults. If we think about it on our own, we're going to get nowhere. This is a collaborative, joined up way of working. Children and young people get the online space. They are way more wedded to it and they are way more embedded in it. If you look at what makes a child vulnerable online, it is actually, the research is showing, similar but also quite different to what makes children vulnerable offline. It's not just your classic sort of socio-economically deprived child who is vulnerable. In fact, actually, a lot of those children don't have online access. You could say they're deprived because they don't have the online access. But the vulnerability often comes with more middle-class aspirational children from families where they have been pushed into a very narrow definition of how they should be as children. They are supervised, helicopter parented, educated, 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 structured after school activities, no time to be, no time to breathe. They are embedding themselves in this online space and creating identities for themselves. So what are we going to do? Are we as adults who don't really understand the challenges that children and young people are facing now? Are we as adults going to make big decisions and tell them how they should behave? Let me give you a really uh, a useful analogy. I wrote this in my review. And I also published my review in a children's version. So there's a, if you don't want to do the 264 pages, you can do the, I think it was 28 pages for kids, which actually is the stuff without all the political stuff written around it. So it's, you know, I'd read that one. But when you talk about children and young people in the online space, a useful analogy is to think about swimming pools. Okay, swimming pools are places of, you know, benefit, health, fun, enjoyment, communication, play, blah, 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 blah. They're also places of risk because you can drown. So when you think about a swimming pool, what do you think about? You think about the fact that you have lifeguards there. Online, they'd be called moderators. You think about the fact that you have um, rules, um, you know, on the, on the round the pool saying no petting when I was a kid. Those old enough in the audience remember, do you remember there were the two people with the hearts coming out of her head and the sort of no petting, no ducking, no running or whatever. But you have the rules. There are rules. You have shallow ends for the younger ones, the new swimmers. Uh, those, those you could argue it's a filtering system. You've got a, a shallow end here where we know you'll be safe and you can't drown and you've got a deeper end for those who can swim well. We've got things like floats and um, uh, rubber rings and water wings and those sausagey things, I can't remember what they're called, that children swim in. Um, these are, you can find the analogies in the online space. But at the end of the day, when the swimming pool is shut and the doors are closed and the locks are on and the alarms are set, there is always the chance that some children will find their way through that because nothing is entirely 100% safe. Now, if those children find their way through it, but they've never been given any experience of a pool and how they can manage themselves in the pool, they'll fall in and they will drown. So my argument is, yes, we need the moderators, the lifeguards, we need the shallow ends, the filters, we need the ways that children can learn to swim, the way they can surf, safe search, walled gardens, whitelists, blacklists, all the things that we do. But at the end of the day, we have to teach children how to swim. And the more we keep them in the water wings, the less we allow them to venture out with our support and supervision, the more vulnerable they will be and the more they will drown in digital waters, which fundamentally they need to embrace because this is our future. So th thank, you, thank you for that overview. Now we've got some questions that the delegates have, have sent in and hopefully we'll cover all the things they want to ask you. We've already covered a lot of the questions I had. Um, one of the questions is, is from, from a parent asking, how should a parent respond to concerns about supporting their children online but also respecting their children's privacy? I think for parents, for me, it's about beginning with your children at the beginning. So as soon as kids start going online and kids as young as three and four are, are now going online, going onto their CBeebies website or, or whatever it is that they're enjoying, just really think about and understand what the experience is going to be. And yeah, it's a real challenge for, for my generation. I think actually it's changing because primary school children now, by and large, have parents in their 20s who are much more familiar. Most of them are social networking and so on. So I think actually the landscape is changing. But I think as far as schools go, most 
senior staff and educators are of my generation and we really need to catch up and it's not as complicated as people think and I think the first thing you do with slightly older kids but even primary school age children is you say to them what do you know what can you teach us what is their experience understand what they're doing and then think about it in the context of how you think about their health and safety generally in life and it is a balance between not wanting to constrain and constrict too much because, as you say, there has to be freedom of growth, of development, of identity, but also not wanting to give too much freedom that actually you expose a, a child who doesn't have the cognitive capacity to manage risk uh, to risk that they can't deal with. So you start with them very young. And, you know, when my kids were little, we had um, locks on the knife drawer. You know, we had locks on the cupboards where the bleach was. I mean, we had stair gates. So with really little ones, you do take a very sort of proactive protectionist approach. But I think as uh, children and young people get older and that kind of ethos and that ethic within the family has developed, the respect develops, you give them greater freedoms online as you do offline. There were young people uh, age 10, maybe 8 or 9 even, uh, with accounts on sites like Facebook and Bebo where the, the terms of service don't allow that. How should parents or, or educators be responding to that challenge? Well, they shouldn't be there, number one, OK? So, you know, the terms of service, the acceptable use policy, the thing that you agree when you set up an account is that you're 13 or older. And I think if you're 8 and 9 and you're on these uh, social networking sites, my question to the parents is, if your 8 or 9-year-old had gone to a youth club, I guess you'd have known about it. What are they doing on a social networking site at that age when clearly they would have had to have faked their age in order to get on and so on and so on and so on. So there is an issue around who's responsible for decision making and how is decision making managed amongst children and young people. I think then when it gets to older children who are going onto social networking sites, obviously at the end of the day that's a decision for an individual parent. What one parent might perceive as harmful for their child, another parent may say actually this is a life-enhancing, empowering experience, I feel my child is able to manage it. Fine, you know, I'm not here to tell people how to parent their kids unless they parent in a way that causes their children harm. But what I would say is this, if your child is online on these kinds of social networking accounts where fundamentally they're in a playground with much older people, then at least make sure you've had a conversation with them and you have had enough supervision in the early days of their relationship with these kinds of uh, sites that they understand really basic but important notions like how to set your privacy settings, how to deal with unwanted people who want to know you, what to do if someone contacts you and asks you for your details and promises you some com competition or something. You know, the uh, online space is anonymous. Not everybody is who they say they are. Again, let's not overblow the risk to children, but the risk is there. And children should be able to resiliently deal with risk but they can't if no one has a conversation with them. And as adults, our job is to enable our kids to develop risk assessment and risk management skills and also to feel comfortable and able to come to us if they need to, if they are in trouble. This being shown as a conference in, in South Wales, was there anything in your call for evidence in your UK-wide consultation that highlighted specific issues for Wales? Um, no. Is the short answer, and the longer answer is on the UK Council for Child, the UK Council for Child Internet Safety. The devolved nations are represented. Um, there are many um, issues that need to be much more granular in terms of our understanding, and certainly in Wales, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, and in Britain. You know, there are patterns of usage that need to be understood specifically to the, the demography of, you know. The, the different nations, but also the demography within different cultures, different parts of the nations, and, and so on. Now, one of the key uh, recommendations that I, that I made that has been followed up and I think is a great thing is that UKIS has a number of working groups. So they have an industry working group. They have a public awareness working group, which looks at education. They have a video gaming working group. They have a working group that looks at vulnerable children and, and so on, uh, vulnerable groups. We also have a research working group and that is headed up by Professor Sonia Livingstone from LSE who has written widely brilliantly not just for not just for Britain but for the UK and also in terms of her EU kids online survey that she's currently involved in so she is heading up the research program and that I know from a UKIS level is looking not just not being kind of Britain centric but looking 
at the devolved nations as well and how we can roll out pieces of research to understand patterns of usage because it's very easy to make generalizations but different kids use in different ways and we need to understand that so we can target our messages and our interventions better. And lastly we've covered many of the issues people had to ask about but there's one here about the future about the rise of the mobile internet the fact this this is moving so fast what are some of the challenges you see ahead as the internet keeps uh, moving at a speed perhaps faster than policy? It's really interesting you ask that question because when I was actually writing the review, so this is late 2007 into mid-2008, Twitter, which now is kind of this huge phenomenon, was kind of like embryonic. It was, you know, no one was kind of tweeting like they are now. So even in the kind of short period of time since I've published, we're into a whole new way of communicating and, the, you know, and, and so on. And, you know, I think we've got to kind of be realistic that, yes, policy is important. I'm very much for self-regulation. I'm very much for policymakers and all the kind of stakeholders to work together. I think that any kind of heavy-handed regulation, unless it's around illegal content, and we know, for example, when it comes to child abuse images, we've got the Internet Watch Foundation, and I absolutely support that. You know, Peter Robbins and, 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 the, and the, the team there are extraordinary people. The work they do to get ISPs, internet service providers, who have agreed at network level to block access to child abuse images. And in the UK, you know, we are, we're moving forward and we're sort of up, almost up to 90% uh, uh, being blocked. So, you know, when it comes to the illegal, you know, stuff, absolutely. But fundamentally, this is a space that is unbelievable in terms of potential and creativity. It's unbelievable in terms of communication. I mean, for myself as a working mother, I couldn't do what I do and be the mother that I am and I want to be if it wasn't for the technology I have. You know, I can write my articles for the Times and Good Housekeeping while I'm cooking supper. You know, I can c communicate with my kids in ways that are really, ef really efficient. It's, it just opens horizons. It, it increases freedoms in some ways. But I think what we also have to acknowledge is if we're too specific around the way we write policy, by the time policy finally gets kind of delivered out and it goes through and it's ratified and the bills are there and la 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 la, do you know what? Technology is five million miles down the road. We're so behind. So at the end of the day, I do believe it's about the end consumer. It's about resilience. Because however much policymakers want to try and keep up, they won't. And however much industry wants to try and keep up in terms of their own kind of self-regulatory practices, they won't. We can keep up because we can look at what our children and young people are doing and we can make sure we jog next to them, not in a way that we're stopping them unless we're stopping them doing something that they shouldn't be doing and we should be able to do that, particularly if they're younger. But we're jogging next to them in a way that says, look, we're interested, what are you doing and how can we support you to make sure you get the best from this and you don't get harmed. That, I think, is sensible, isn't it? It's proportionate, it's balanced. And for all those that say childhood is toxic, children shouldn't use computers, really, go move to another planet. I mean, this is the world we live in. Let's embrace it. There's great things there. But let's also be realistic, sensible, proportionate, balanced, and respectful of our children and young people and give them the tools and the strategies to be amazing digital citizens. Tanya, on behalf of Wise Kids and WISP and, and all the people at the conference, thank you ever so much. Thank you.